Why do we celebrate St. Patrick's Day on March 17th? because that's when the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of Ireland observe it. It was added to the Catholic Church's official liturgical calendar in the 1600s, thanks largely to the influence of the Irish-born Franciscan friar and historian Luke Wadding. And while the 17th of March was pegged as the day for celebrating the Apostle of Ireland, the Church does occasionally move the date, like it did in 1940 and 2008, when St. Patrick's Day fell during Holy Week and was thus shifted to April 3rd and March 15th respectively. So yeah, bottom line, the church sets the date of St. Patrick's Day. But why'd they make the 17th of March the default date? Because as early as the 9th and 10th centuries, there were Catholics in Europe, mostly Irish, who celebrated the Feast of St. Patrick before it got on the universal calendar and went worldwide. Which then begs the question, why did those very first Irish revelers celebrate St. Patrick's Day on March 17th? Because according to popular history, that's when St. Patrick died, March 17th, 461 CE. Although some people claim he actually died in 493 CE, E, granted that would have made him more than a century old. Regardless, the accepted story is that Patrick died on the 17th of March in the aptly named town of Down Patrick in County Down, and his followers at the time remembered that date and celebrated it henceforth as Patrick's feast day. Only we don't know, and most likely will never know with any certainty on which day St. Patrick actually kicked the bucket. That's because Patrick himself, his letters specifically, are the primary source materials historians have used to reconstruct his life. And unfortunately for all of his good deeds, Patrick did not jot down the date of his own death death, which, I mean, was just not very considerate. Perhaps even more unfortunately, for those of you keen on seeking the truth, later biographers and hagiographers would give the saint a retroactive glow-up, turning him into a sort of super-powered wizard who scared away snakes and defeated druids with a magical staff, making it hard to distinguish St. Patrick fact from St. Patrick fiction. Which leads us to, was St. Patrick's Day pegged to the spring equinox? Given the unreliable accounting of his life story, we don't know for sure that St. Patrick died on March 17th. But what we do know for sure is that the 17th of March is conspicuously close to the Northern Hemisphere's spring or vernal equinox, which in any given year will fall on the 19th, 20th, or 21st day of March. Derived from the Latin for equal night, the equinox refers to a time when sunlight and darkness occur in equal measure in a single day, which is to say it is a time when the Earth's northern and southern hemispheres receive equal amounts of sunlight, which is to say it is a time when Earth's equator passes through the geometric center of the sun's disk. Look, there are lots of ways to say it, and regardless of how they thought of it, our ancestors have been celebrating the equinoxes, both vernal and autumnal, for thousands of years. For many cultures, the spring equinox in particular marks not only the changing of the season, but also the beginning of a new year. Case in point, the ancient Babylonians had their calendar start on the first full moon after the spring equinox. And the ancient Persians famously celebrated No Ruz, an equinoctial New Year festival that is still celebrated to this day, some 3,000 plus years later, in Iran and surrounding countries. It begins on the evening of March 20th and ends on the evening of the 21st, which is interesting because the ancient Goidelic or Gaelic-speaking Celts measured their days evening to evening, which means that they would have celebrated the equinox over a similar stretch of time. Now, not to jump to conclusions, just kidding, let's jump to conclusions. Maybe there was some cultural connective tissue between the ancient Persians, practitioners of Zoroastrianism, and the ancient Irish, practitioners of Celtic paganism. After all, the Persian language, aka Farsi, and the Irish language are both ultimately derived from the same proto-language, proto-Indo-European. Turns out I'm not even close to being the first person to search for, admittedly tenuous at best, parallels between the ancient Persians and the ancient Irish. Is Nuwada of the Silver Hand actually the Persian prophet Zoroaster? This is the controversial theory of a one Mr. Charles Valancey, or General Charles Valancey, I should say. He was a British military surveyor who went to Ireland sometime in the 1760s and by all accounts fell in love with the place, making it his adoptive home. Valancey certainly did a lot of good in helping to preserve Irish folklore and culture. For example, he painstakingly drew diagrams of Irish artifacts and wrote about his first-hand observations of Irish religious and celebratory customs, but Valancey's reputation took a hit when he began making, uh, what do you call them? Oh right, wild, unsubstantiated claims. One of his more infamous being that the ruler of the Tua de Danan, the Irish gods Nuada Ergit Lam, of the Silver Hand or Silver Arm, who I talked about at length, arm's length, I'm sorry, in my video on the Irish mythology behind the Banshees of Inna Sharon, was the same person as Zoroaster, aka Zarathustra, the Iranian prophet and religious reformer who is regarded as the spiritual founder of Zoroaster. Astrianism. To quote Valancey's 1786 book, A Vindication of the Ancient History of Ireland, In ancient Persia, so in ancient Ireland, there were two sects of fire worshippers, one that lighted the fires on the tops of mountains and hills and others in towers, an innovation said to be brought about by Mog Nuada, or the Magus of the New Law, otherwise called Ergodlam, or Golden Hand, who was the Zerdost or Gold Hand of the Persians, who is said to have lost his life by a Turanian Scythian in 
Indian in a tumult raised by this innovation. So Magnuwada had his hand cut off in the struggle, but one of the Tua Dadan colony or Chaldean Magi supplied the loss with a silver or golden hand. End quote. Huge if true. And bringing this back to the spring equinox, Zoroaster was one of history's biggest spring equinox cheerleaders. Wait, did you just call the founder of one of, if not the world's oldest religions, a cheerleader? Yay! Moving on. To quote Mary Boyce, scholar of Iranian languages, it seems a reasonable surmise that no ruse, the holiest of the Zoroastrian festivals with deep doctrinal significance, was founded by Zoroaster himself. Source, Encyclopedia Aronica. But even if Zoroaster didn't found no ruse, the 11th century Persian historian Gardizi attests to the fact that Zoroaster highly emphasized the celebration of no ruse and its fall counterpart, Mergen. Now, only if Nuada of the Silver Hand had any connection whatsoever to the equinoxes in the Irish myths, there might be an interesting point to make here. But he doesn't, so there isn't. And that's because the Celts of ancient Ireland didn't really care too much about equinoxes, or solstices for that matter. Sure, they knew about them and likely celebrated them, but the Celts were much more concerned with the days that fell between the equinoxes and solstices, so-called cross-quarter days. That's when the four major festivals of the Celts took place. There was Samhain, the Celtic New Year, which began on the evening of October 31st, falling between the fall equinox and the winter solstice, Imbolc, which began on the evening of February 1st, falling between the winter solstice and the spring equinox, then there's Beltane on May 1st, between the spring equinox and summer solstice, and finally Lunasa on August 1st, between the summer solstice and fall equinox. But even though the Celts weren't the biggest equinox fans, that doesn't mean other earlier Irish pagans didn't hold the equinoxes in higher esteem. The Law Crew Equinox how the pre-Celtic Irish used a megalith to mark an important astronomical moment. The Celts weren't the first humans to settle in Ireland. Most of you probably knew that already, but it always bears repeating. Indeed, the arrival of Ireland's first inhabitants dates back to at least 7,000 or 8,000 BCE, while more recent discoveries may push that date back even further to 10,500 or even 31,000 BCE. But I don't need to go back that far to make my point. The Proto-Celtic language, and thus the Celts, who are a linguistic group and not a continuous lineage of people, only came into existence in 1300 BCE, or perhaps as far back as 3000 BCE if British archaeologist Barry Cunliffe's Celtic from the West theory is to be believed. No matter which way you slice it, there were people in Ireland for thousands of years before the arrival of the Celts, and they built some impressive megalithic monuments. So impressive that the Celts would map their own mythology onto the tumuli in cairn-dotted Irish landscape, reimagining the island's mighty mounds as the homes of the gods, who later became known as the fairies or a she people of the hills. Back to the megaliths. As noted by journalist Frank McNally, writing for the Irish Times, 5,000 years before television, our ancestors used to pass their nights by watching the sky. They didn't just dance with the stars, they studied them too, and by way of recording highlights, they built great stone monuments all over Ireland, doubling as burial chambers, carefully lined with the main celestial events. At least one of these, on the western fringes of County Meath, marks the spring and autumn equinoxes. End quote. This is Cairn T, also known as Cairn Ban, or the Hag's Cairn of the Loch Crew Megalithic Complex, which dates to 3200 BCE. On the spring and fall equinoxes, the morning sun illuminates the cairn's passage and chamber, bathing the chamber's backstone, which is adorned with solar symbols, in golden sunlight for nearly an hour. So yeah, the spring equinox, clearly important to the pre-Celtic Irish. Important enough, perhaps, that the Irish Celts continued to celebrate it, and in the wake of Christianization, the church felt it necessary to peg the feast day of St. Patrick to it, a common maneuver for the church actually, which put St. Bridget's Day on the same day as Imbolc, and which put All Saints Day, aka All Hallows Day, on the same date as Samhain, and Lamas Day on the same date as Lunasa. It was sort of their thing. I'll leave you with this quote from Newgrange.com. The early Christian church in Ireland incorporated pre-Christian spirituality and festivals into the new religion. It is conceivable that the Spring Equinox Festival became Christianized and rebranded as St. Patrick's Day. The Spring Equinox is the beginning of the light half of the year when the sun is strongest and the days are longer than the Knights. St. Patrick brought the light of a different sun, the Son of God, to Ireland. The adaptable Irish Celts may have simply rebranded the Spring Equinox Festival to St. Patrick's Feast Day. If you enjoyed this video, please like and comment and basically just tap all of the shiny buttons and by the end of it, make sure you are subscribed to the Irish Myths channel. That really, really helps. And if you want to learn more controversial facts about Ireland's favorite patron saint, check out my book, St. Patrick in Your Pocket, 20 Questions with the Apostle of Ireland. And if you want to learn more about the darker side of Irish mythology, check out my book, Irish Monsters in Your Pocket, a tiny little book about Irish dragons, werewolves, vampires, banshees, headless horsemen, and other beastly beings. My name is I.E. Neverday, editor of the short story collection Neon Druid and creator of IrishMyths.com. 
Thanks for coming out.